Scientists, and on behalf of EOL, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. John Dennis, NCAR Scientist. Dr. Dennis received a PhD in computer science in 2005. He's a scientist in the Computer Information and Systems Laboratory, CISL, at NCAR. John co-leads a research group that focuses on improving the ability of large-scale geoscience applications to utilize current and future computing platforms. His research interests include parallel algorithm and compiler optimization, graph partitioning, and data-intensive computing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dennis for his seminar titled, Leveraging Exascale Technology to Advance NCAR Science Within EOL. And a reminder for those of you online, throw your questions in Slido at the bottom of your screen and we'll take them at the end. Dr. Dennis? Is there a mic? Or do I just have to speak up? Uh, the mic's on the podium. Oh. Oh, that thing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so the, we're going to talk about uh, exascale technology. And this was um, work of the exascale tiger team. And the goal was to determine the best course of action with respect to the utilization of exascale technology to advance NCAR science objectives. And so um, we decided to define exascale technologies as GPU enablement, data compression, parallelization of post-processing workflows, and cloud computing. Um, these were, um, and this was an NCAR-wide community uh, committee. Unfortunately, it didn't have any uh, EOL representative, which was the one that we missed out on. Um, but it was the work of, of, of the committee and it, and it uh, represented uh, at least a year and a half or maybe two of work. And what we did was we created recommendations based on two sources of information. There was a NCAR-wide survey, um, of, and again, this is uh, software uh, kind of focused and hardware. And uh, there was also laboratory-specific focus groups, and these were actually quite fun because you would ask the question, what science would you perform if you could magically eliminate uh, limitations? And um, we didn't specify what kind of limitations, so they could say that we just don't have enough disk space, we don't have enough computing power, or we don't have the, the right graduate students um, to do the science. So this was kind of open-ended. Um, and so we, we came up with one set of overall set of recommendations for the NCAR directorate and uh, seven laboratory-specific recommendations. And we, we hope this to be kind of a continuing a uh, place for further discussion. Um, we're, um, so I've, I've given this, this presentation, well, I'm, I, we're giving this presentation to all seven laboratories, uh, that you're the fourth one. Um, so, um, so a little bit of a background on computing trends. This is probably, um, um, we wanted to define an exascale system versus exascale technology. So, it's unclear if NCAR will ever purchase an exascale system, so this would be a, you know, a derecho follow-on or something like this. But NCAR scientists, scientists will have access to systems based upon exascale technology. So the um, stuff that has uh, GPU, uh, GPU enablement and, and uh, lossy data compression. And the other, the other kind of consideration here is um, the cost of electricity to run HPC centers is very significant. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with the Net Zero Initiative. Um, so th this is going to kind of, um, this is NCAR's goal to, to reduce its climate, imp uh, its, its uh, carbon footprint on the environment. And so they project by 2030, 63% uh, of NCAR's carbon emissions will be from the supercomputer. So this includes uh, the, the airplanes that you fly, um, the, the buildings that we heat and that we light, and the, 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 um, the cars that, and, and vans that we drive. So, um, so this, is, this is quite significant. Um, you know, one of the, the, the thing to, to keep in mind here is that GPU-based computing is approximately three times more energy efficient than CPU. And so I think this is, um, you know, we see areas in EOLs um, 
with, with EOL's science objectives, it could benefit from, from GPU computing as well as the other exascale um, technologies. And again, you know, the, the notion is that big science needs to be energy efficient because we all are all stewards of our, of our uh, environment. So, so again, there was, so there was some overall findings that were kind of consistent throughout uh, the entire institution. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about those initially, and then um, there'll be EOL specific recommendations that'll come in the second part of the, the talk. Um, NCAR science aren't broadly, broadly practicing exascale software development. Um, there's really not an explicit prioritization from leadership. Um, there's funding issues. This is always a, a challenge. Um, staff skills and familiarity with new technologies and the time to shift while still accomplishing existing workloads. And um, this is another thing that we, that we see. It's, 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 um, sometimes it's more acute in particular uh, laboratories than others, um, but a meaningful uh, collaboration between scientists and software uh, engineers with respect to HPC and exascale practices. Um, some overall findings, uh, there's no, novel science outcomes can be enabled through in each laboratory. Um, we were kind of, we were a little surprised on that, um, but kind of delighted. Um, so, and prioritization and funding uh, needs to be actually be, um, incorporated into the strategic plans. This is not something that you can just kind of do on the side have some person do this on Friday afternoon, but you need to actually plan for it and make it part of your overall strategy. And, um, and also the uh, larger cross laboratory software development uh, are a potential opportunity, or a potential vehicle for this. Um, so recommendations for NCAR, uh, explicitly modify NCAR's and the LCPO strategic plans to include a response to exascale technology. This is not saying, uh, we're not coming and saying you need to do, um, you need to do the specific thing, you need to uh, think about it and then commit to it and, and do something. Um, foster a co-design culture where science objectives represent a, a collaboration between sci scientific and software engineering leadership. Um, this doesn't always happen. <laughs> um, need to identify internal and external funding um, to, to uh, respond to our recommendations. Um, communicate to staff the importance of exascale technology on the scientific mission uh, of NCAR. And so, um, so that's kind of the general stuff. You'll, you're probably saying, how does this, how does this um, impact me? Um, and that's, that's the next section of the talk. So EOL. Um, so, um, so we looked at some of the, the EOL science objectives and some of it does appear to be exascale friendly. Um, EOL is not actually very well positioned to leverage exascale technology. This is almost a general statement across NCAR, so you shouldn't take that personal. Um, and uh, so one of, the, one of the things, and we'll get into specifically where the areas could be, but um, the DART and WARF are not currently GPU enabled. We're thinking about Aussies, the, the use of, potential use of Aussies. Um, and um, there was also some discussion about lossy data compression on EOL science. Um, so um, I think another real challenge here, and this is, this is uh, kind of eye-opening for Sizzle as well, is that there's really very limited interactions between EOL and Sizzle, or maybe I should say there, it could be strengthened, would perhaps a better way to put that. Um, but there is some uh, existing investment in GPU enablement. This was a Samurai, which was a, um, a data simulation code that will, we believe will be used on the APAR data sets. So, and this was some very significant speed up that um, we we're able to, uh, uh, to achieve. Um, so how were um, exascale friendly science objectives identified? Um, so again, these are objectives that would match with the technology. These are not necessarily objectives that are great for your strategic plan. It's your decision to, to, to make that decision. 
Um, but we broke it into three different categories, modest, which uh, can be achieved today with a larger allocation. I don't consider that particularly interesting. Um, the unlikely, which is not possible in the next 20 years, which is um, kind of past the time horizon of my interest at least. And uh, interesting, which is, um, so currently not possible or easy, but is possible in the next 10, or uh, uh, three to 10 years with significant effort. So I think these are the interesting areas. Um, ones that kind of, that, that were noteworthy was, um, apparently the, um, you, you deploy a large number of instruments per, per year and, um, and currently you've only done Aussies. I, I, I learned what Aussies were. Uh, they are not from Australia, <laughs> as I initially assumed. Um, so, so you, um, so there was, so there was mention that uh, the potential to use Aussies to, kind of uh, tune the instruments on it, all the instruments that are deployed, and I think observational campaigns um, could uh, benefit from lossy data compression, and cloud computing as well, and potentially also parallel post uh, post processing. Um, I can I can go into more in, in the next slide here. Um, so spe specific challenges for EOL, um, there were um, one of the things that came through was there insufficient disk storage for both observational and and data analysis. So the scientists were saying oh, we only get enough data data storage to to. Uh, you know, to, to collect the, the observational data, they wanted to do analysis on it, and then they were like, but we don't have enough space for that. And so the observational data was prioritized. Um, and insufficient computational capabilities for broader usage of uh, OSSEs. Um, again, there was, I believe this was one, um, there was done on one of the instruments, and um, it was suggested that it could be done on hundreds of instruments. And so this is a this is a computational challenge that I think is is doable and it's doable in the, the time frame that we're talking about here. Uh, so specific recommendations for EOL. Um, I would I you know I'm going to suggest to to reevaluate the laboratory's overall disk usage. Um, you know, there was a, a number of people that said we just don't have the disk space. Uh, but and the question is, um, um, you know, how 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 much uh, disk space are you missing? And then, um, and I would, or we would strongly encourage you to advocate for more if that's what you need. Um, I know that historically. Um, uh, disk allocations kind of are, are shaped by historical usage patterns. So if you haven't used much in the past, maybe you don't get as much in the, in the, in the next year. So um, we're concerned that that may be happening with EOL. And so, um, so I, we're gonna I'm strongly encourage to advocate for additional sizzle-based disk allocation. Um, there was also some discussion in the group where um, uh, some people were saying, yeah, we use data compression, and then another group was like, oh, no, I'm concerned about that. So um, that's two different responses, and so um, that could use some clarity uh, what lossy data compression could potentially do or augment your um, effective storage space. And again, engage with Sizzle regarding cyber infrastructure issues. Um, I feel like, um, you know, of all the la of all the laboratories, I know the least about what EOL does, which is should be that way. Um, insufficient computational capabilities for the broader usage of OCs. Um, this was um, there are certain GPU enabled models um, that may be applicable. Um, MPAS A, uh, CM1, or Fast Eddy. I understand that you currently use or have used um, uh, WARF with Dart, so um, WARF is not going to be GPU enabled. Um, so um, the, these ones are. I don't know if they are scientifically valid. Um, there's obviously two uh, two LES models there, and then and then a, and then a, um, at least a regional, I guess, version of MPAS A might be um, 
applicable. And, and, and again, engage with us regarding cyber infrastructure issues. We really, you know, this is, this is on us for not, uh, you know, perhaps keeping in, in touch with you guys as much. Um, and it kind of, it kind of, you know, and honestly, it's it's kind of a historical trend because uh, in the past, Sizzle's been kind of model and simulation dominated, uh, centric in their their, but we we have much more of a data, uh, kind of a holistic data and uh, computation. So this is hopefully a good time to uh, reengage or engage. So. Um, that's all. I was hoping to have some some uh, some discussions. Thanks, John. Are there any questions from the room? Matt's closer. <laughs> Um, thanks. It's an admirable effort to try and consolidate across the labs like that. Uh, maybe, so I, for one, hear lossy data compression for raw data and, and think that's, you know, a, like never do it. So maybe you could explain what lossy data compression is a little so, more. So you're not, you're not keeping, well, okay, so yes. Um, so typically with simulations, you, you, have, you keep numbers that are 32-bit or 64-bit um, real values. So th this is arguing that you don't have to keep all those bits, that there's you know, the, first, the first eight or whatever are relevant, and you know, the, the rest is kind of uh, noise. And again, for an instrument, you, your instrument may not capture the full fidelity of the 32-bit you know, value. Okay, you're right. So that's, um, there are some important distinctions there about knowing the precision of your instrument and yeah. only keeping those bits versus lossy might mean you, you lose that original precision, but you preserve some sort of, you know, behavior or trend or signal that you're looking for. Yeah. So that you can't, so, yeah, so that, that seems important to make the distinction between not losing the actual yeah, precision of the instrument just to um, compress the data. Yeah. So not that there's not more we can do for data compression, but yeah, I mean, you know, as an observationalist, you may do this really well, but the simulation people, you know, that are running climate models don't do this particularly well. They just keep everything, right? Because they they don't think about how how much information is really valid there. Okay. Thanks. So um, I was at, I went to the session or the um, remote session where you asked the question, yeah. you know, what could you do without limitations? Yeah. Uh, I'm sort of disappointed that none of my answers showed up in those two categories because I'm pretty sure I'm the number one GPU user on, on in EOL. Okay. And the reason I I'm sure is because I use the entire allocation. All right, I, I'm sorry, Rem <laughs> remind me what's your... So, I mean, the big application here that's not showing up is yeah. data processing and yeah. how you do the signal processing to recover, you know, high fidelity, low noise estimates from these noisy observations that we're talking about. Yeah. And that's a huge application area that's growing and growing and it includes machine learning and it includes some other more traditional statistical signal processing methods. Okay. But on any given day, you can go look, do a QSTAT on Casper and see how many GPUs I'm using. Okay, I, I apologize. <laughs> the question, okay, so the question is, do you have enough today or would you really benefit from having 10 times the amount? Yeah, so this is exactly what I said though, is I want more GPUs on Casper. Yeah. Like, and the problem for me, and it's partly a knowledge-based thing for me, yeah. is I don't know how to leverage derecho. Like if I ask for a node and I get four GPUs, yeah. uh, I mean, we're working with actually the machine learning group in Sizzle where we're trying to do multi-GPU training. So that's its own separate thing. But in general, most of what I need is one node with one GPU and I'd like a lot of them. Yeah. So I would love to have more just independent nodes on Casper. Yeah. 
you, I, I mean, you, there, there should be some way to get it so that you can use four, right? Uh, so I'm running, it's high throughput computing, so they're all like very independent jobs. But you but, should be able to group four yeah. independent jobs together, right? I agree, but that's like a whole, that's a whole nother development step okay. for me. At this I, point though, okay. like, if I can just throw, you know, throw out 50 jobs on 50 GPUs, that's great. Yeah. I apologize, I'll go back and uh, review my notes. Okay. <laughs> All right, we have a question from online. Um, jung says, thank you for the presentation. Does CISL have a development plan for GPU-enabled WARF, CUDA WARF, and data assimilation system? Um, we do not have a GPU-enabled WARF development plan. Um, this, was, um, uh, this was something that MCV decided not to go for. And so, um, unfortunately, that's, that's their decision. Um, and um, so we don't have that. The, the I believe, DART, um, th this is one of the investments that, okay, this is a recommendation that, we're, that we have for, um, for CISL, is the GPU-enabled DART. So that's a, that's a desire, um, but not a plan yet. It's short of a plan. Thanks. Any other questions from the room? or discussion points? I, you know, I think, I think one, of the, one of the other motivations that we had was we want the science to lead the, the software development. Uh, and so we were looking for what science are we gonna do, do a breakthrough and then make develop, uh, uh, investments in those areas. So as far as the point about um, insufficient disk space for data and analysis, it, it also, it seems to me part of the challenge is having the disk space close to the CPU for the data, you know, throughput intensive operations. Yes. And that's, um, so I'm wondering if that's some place where, where more help from Sizzle would, you know, assist that. Like we don't need to use, do analysis over NFS, for example, either they're faster remote file system protocols we should be using setups well, or we should be a different architecture or should be using yeah i mean i mean the, the hp system the hp uh, the hpc system of the red show doesn't use msf uh, anywhere. no of course not i wouldn't yeah. think so <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that's but that's what we have here yes and where you know do we have to move everything there in order to get more cpu closer to faster disk or is there something else that we could be doing uh, I think I think that's I, I think that's an excellent question. It's like, you know, can you uh, can you move more of your computing onto the, the red show, for example, versus in 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 house process processing? I, I I don't think that we've talked about this in the past. Or I feel like I feel like. I mean. I think the answer should be yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's a yeah. But then back to the, if only we had more time beyond our <laughs> regular work to to do that, I guess. Um, and it it this ties into the whole, you know, parallelization, right? That yeah. Um, we would benefit from adopting more parallelization in our post processing, um, having more knowledge. Um, of frameworks like Dask or something like that. If there are some established practice for, here's a great way to partition your 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 post processing. Yes. And so that it will run on our local servers, but but when we're ready, it will scale up to you know and, and port to a separate computer, and we can run them even faster. Yeah. It, uh, that would be great to iterate on a post project analysis. Yeah. Regenerate our data sets in, in minutes instead of hours. Well, so. I mean, I'll I'll pull up the example of the samurai. Or they were, um, uh, they came to me and said, you know, this, um, you know, our current analysis is taking two days, right? And they're like, APAR is going to be like 
so much larger, and then they're like, what can you what can you do about that? We're we're gonna it's gonna we're not gonna be done processing the, the, the data from a flight until the next one. So, I mean, so they came they came to us and talked to us, and we were able to get 120 full speed up um, on the code on the process uh, by by you know by optimizing this code. And so, so they, they, you know, it dropped from, you know, it was, it, it dropped from, uh, you know, almost a day to, you know, whatever that is. Okay. And that was by GPU enabling. That, that the, so we did it, we, we GPU enabled it, we, we optimized the code, and we changed the numerical output in, in appropriate ways that were, were uh, acceptable. So, so I mean, this was so. This was so. Um, what this meant is a 120 fold speed up, as you, you can do. You know, it, it gets to the point where you could run the observation in somewhat lower resolution in real time on the, on the system as you're as you're flying the C-133 to the storm. If, if you can move the data to the GPUs, yes, in that speed, yeah. So, um, so th these things are possible. Um, I can't guarantee 120 x speed up on every post processing data flow, but this kind of stuff is possible. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else have anything to add to the discussion? So, how do we get how do we get you? or your team to review our algorithms and actual, or our software and actually parallelize it? What, like what you're describing happened with APAR, like is there a formalized process for that or do we just? There, there is not a formalized process for that. Um, because I mean, the, the way that happened is George Bryan and MQ was like, you know, uh, post-processing takes forever and we had, you know, talked to Michael Bell, I believe, at CSU and then we got the code from them and, and are like, oh, this other went really well. So there's not a really great formal process. I'm looking at Sherry over there who's hiding in the corner. Um, so, but, but it's, it's, you know, I mean, I, I think one of the, I, I think, you know, they, they identified the APAR processing as, a, as an important science problem that was running really slow. And so they brought the, that to us. So I mean, I think you know, it's it's other. What what are your uh, important process? You know, post processing workflows that are that are problematic because your vision might be problematic in the, in, in the future instance. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? So what more discussion were you hoping to get out of this, or have we given you the feedback you were looking for? Well, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, I, you know, I, I, I think that it's important to, um, it's important to have a plan. You know, I would, I, I would argue that, you know, it's important to have a plan on what you want to do with this thing. For example, you know, with, with um, you know, what would you like to achieve from a science and then come up with kind of this is what we're going to do to achieve that, and you know, and then and then you kind of look for resources to be able to do that, whether that's external funding. Or, okay. So I, I think that coming up with a plan would, would be really nice, you know, and say you're going to do something, right? And, and don't give it to somebody who's overloaded already. science do you want to, what kind of science do you want to push forward? Do you want to be able to do options on, on all of your instruments? Do you want to do them on, instead of doing one, do you want to do them on 10 of them or something? What, what additional post-processing do you want to do, right? That's really a science, uh, a science question. All right, well, if there's no further questions from the room, 
you guys get some of your time back today. Thanks again. Thank you.